Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to our sixth lecture in the study of Indian family and kinship. Today we are going to discuss a very important concept in the study of kinship, that of relatedness. Till now for the past five lectures we have looked at how kinship has been studied in India and across the world theoretically through a conceptualization of structure. Levi Strauss has been at the forefront of this conceptualization and has inspired many decades of very serious study on the idea of marriage, blood, gift giving and other conceptions of kin and family. In the last class we looked at how the conceptualization of the joint family in India has taken its own political and economic social discourse. It has been studied within the sociology of India but also has ramifications on how we think of kinship. The study of the family in India has also led to a questions regarding how relevant categories that Levi Strauss developed as part of his initial foray into kinship and which were later taken up by other theorists are important or relevant in the study of kinship and family in India today. For some time now in the anthropology of kinship, the shift towards newer ideas and meanings has been felt. Ever since David Schneider found kinship to be based on the assumption of sexual relationship, kinship itself has been undergoing major transformations. After Schneider's earth shattering critique of kinship, for a long time kinship itself went into redundance. Nobody really studied kinship. Until in the late 90s when Janet Carsten resurrected the study of kinship through the idea of relatedness. Relatedness has come to become a very important conceptual category within the study of kinship. It has also become a very important conceptual category within anthropology itself. Relatedness has become a new methodological and conceptual tool to look at how kinship forms itself and spreads across the world. Relatedness has the most potent form of uh, the motor is the most potent way of actually carrying out cross-cultural research on kin and kinship. In this class, we will look at how relatedness has come to mark the study of kinship and family in India. But before we do that, I need to discuss what relatedness is. Janet Carsten in her seminal book, Cultures of Relatedness, lays out certain key ideas of what relatedness is. She defines relatedness as inspired by folk or indigenous models of kin and kinship. What are folk and indigenous models? She looks and pertains to particular cultures having their own meaning of kinship. She suggests that one doesn't have to fall back on analytical categories of blood and marriage to identify what each culture thinks of. This is important considering past decade, decades work of how kinship is only restricted to the idea of blood and marriage. We have been studying blood and marriage for the past five lectures, so you can understand how important it is. And to suggest an analytical category that goes away from that idea means we are engaging with something new. Carsten suggests that the unifying idea of blood and marriage is also based on certain assumptions that we make about cultures and their cross-cultural comparison. To presume that what is relevant for America or Euro-American kinship will be relevant when we study India is not correct. Carsten suggests an engagement with what that culture really understands as kinship. This is particular when we understand and think of kinship in India and all that we have done till now in terms of how it is also marked through a Euro-American engagement. Thus when we think of cross-cousin marriage or when we think of blood relationships in North India, we are again invoking the larger categories that are identified and recognized in Western kinship. Blood and marriage are important in the Euro-American kinship model and are often easily translatable into Indian circumstances and situations, but may not actually reflect the reality as it is. 
In such situations, Kastan's idea of relatedness has come to be very important in understanding how indigenous theories of being and relating can be very important in knowing how people actually think of themselves and their kin. Because ultimately when we think about kinship, we are not only thinking about relatives, we are also thinking about ourselves and our own sense of self. Let us begin by looking at Kasten's important conceptualization of her own field of study based in Mal Malaysia, uh, the village and area of Pulau Langkawi. She looks at Malay kinship amongst the Pulau Langkawi in a very important note of figuring out her conceptualization of relatedness. Amongst the Malays, it's interesting to note that the idea of being kin is through certain modes of transformation and, re and transference. A key idea within relatedness is that of substance. We will discuss this further as we go, go along. But for the time being, it is important to understand that substance or the notion of substance is linked to its inherent ability to be able to transfer itself from one person to another, from one body to another and from one community to another. The ability of transference links you intimately to many people. One example of substance, one foremost example of substance is blood. Other examples of substance are breast milk, food, clothing, saliva, sexual fluids, etc. All of these become important nodes in making kin. So while we think about uh, relatedness, these modes of substance sharing and being come to mark the way in which the Malays and Pulau Langkawi think of themselves. Kasten develops two significant ideas of how substance works amongst the Pulau Langkawis. The first is through the idea of the house or Dapur. Dapur and its residents are linked together because they share the same hearth. Now the hearth is a very important concept in India as well. We saw how the hearth becomes the identifying factor of the joint family and those who live and eat together. Similarly, the hearth in different cultures is the key factor uniting people within a unitary group. The stove or the, the uh, oven where you cook food and then serve people is a very important mode of making kin. Amongst the Pulau Langkawi, similarly, the Dapur home or hearth is one such space that makes kin. All those who stay in the same Dapur or hearth are linked together. The other mode of making kin amongst the Malay is the whole system of siblinghood, also known as the Semangat. The Semangat or siblingship is a very strong notion amongst the Malay. It begins with the birth of the child with its umbilical cord. Interestingly, interestingly amongst the Malay, the umbilical cord is actually a sibling of the newly born baby and must be buried in a proper place to avoid bringing bad luck to the newborn. It is also important that the placenta and the umbilical cord be properly taken care of to ensure long good health of the child. This is critical because such practices imagine spaces of kinship where, there, where ideally one would not think of kinship. The placenta and the umbilical cord as an imagined sibling is then transferred onto other such people who may become sibling in reality with the child. That does not mean siblings who are born later, but children of the same generation who may come to share food and come to play with the child in the same Dapur. The sharing of substances and space thus becomes critical. Besides substance, hearth, food, sharing is the other thing that marks out relatedness. To share is to also make kin. We cannot ignore that essential aspect of kinning and relatedness. Thus, it is important to understand how caste and develops relatedness through a cultural context like the Malays. She suggests that relatedness amongst the Malays works in oppositions of the home or the Dapur and the siblingship of the Semantak, Semangat. Sorry. How does this work in, in its true conceptualization? The Dapur is also not just the house or hearth, it is also the womb, the womb where the mother carries her child, which is another reason why the child with its placenta and umbilical cord are also kin. Thus, all those who are kin in the womb are also kin otherwise. 
Now, this is again important because you have to remember that the universal rule of the incest taboo still applies. It is only who you identify as siblings that makes it operative. So, amongst the Malays, all those who eat from the same hearth or are born in the same womb are linked together in a state of siblingship. This is critical because children when they are young play together and may come and eat in each other's homes, making them and turning them into siblings. This has permutations and combinations and implications for the future amongst the Malays. Those who eat together, share the same substance and share in the same woman's womb or breast milk are kin and cannot marry, even or procreative parents may be different. Such an idea means that the act of feeding a child warm food also is potent and full of kinship. Thus, Kasten notes that amongst the Malas, when a woman feeds another's child warm cooked rice, she automatically makes kin. Heat and relatedness travel together. Substance travels through warm bodies. An example of such an idea is how menstrual blood, which is warm, has the potential to make, click, make kin. Substances such as blood, food, feeding, eating and saliva are critical to the idea of Malay relatedness. They are multiple ideas, they are not just one. Then unlike what Schneider identifies as just one form of biogenetic substance. They are not just diffused biogenetic substance, but multiple ways of being and connecting. An interesting example of such a notion would be how in Islamic societies, also in the Northwest Frontier Province and in Malaysia, the sharing of breast milk means your kin, even though you may have different mothers. I mentioned this in an earlier class about how the Emperor Akbar gave more importance to, his, uh, to the woman who breastfed him while he was a child. If you see the popular film on Jodha Akbar, you will uh, notice the scene where his wet nurse who now rules over the kingdom calls upon him to, uh, up, you know, to, to let go of the grudge he has against her own biological son who has been plotting against the emperor. These are interesting notions of how children are connected as well. Again, going back to Kasten and her uh, conceptualization of Malay kinship, children are often in this space of in betweenness. This is critical. What does in betweenness mean? In betweenness is a symbol of a certain form of fluidity. You are permeable, you are fluid, and you are ready to receive and give substances. Thus, children travel very easily between the hearth, the home, the dapur, and the sibling group of the semangat. This is critical in understanding how children are in a state of being made into kin. This fluidity is another sign of relatedness. Because there are different kinds of substances and different ways of being and relating, fluidity is very easy to enact. You can be a very fluid person and can take on multiple substances and be kin to multiple people. And that is the most important criteria of understanding kinship in the way Kasten imagines it. Therefore, in a, in a very important moment of fluidity, we see Mekim Marit's idea of the individual person coming up again. If you remember from an earlier lecture where I discussed how Mekim Marit uh, suggests that the Indian person is more fluid individual than the Western person who is bounded, closed and individual, such an idea is resurrected in Karsten's understanding of relatedness. To be individual and embedded in your multiple relationships gives you that flexibility to be fluid. You can be related to one and many people. Thus, the parameters of relatedness grow and become more and more dynamic. In that sense, relatedness is a processual idea. Here, kinship is always being made and unmade. It is in a continuous process of being constructed. This is critical to understanding how kinship is not stuck in space and time. An idea that we tried to deconstruct in looking at how the joint family in India is not just one moment or one sense of the family, but multiple. Thus, kin, as you will understand, are not only those who you are linked to by blood or marriage, but many more. When we think about fictions of kinship then, this becomes critical. Are the fictive kin really fictive or are they something else? 
can we think of a fictional in kinship or are we only playing back to the galleries in terms of what biology or blood is in trying to think of something beyond the behemoth of biology we come across the idea of relatedness where fluidity and indigenous notions of kin become very important markers of how we think of ourselves and the people we are related to interestingly in carsten's idea of substance and relationality she discusses different modes of substance different kinds of substance and how they are transferred here the idea of transubstantiality and co-substantiality becomes very important by transubstantiality we mean the transference of substances which carry with them particular attributes now this is important when we look at for instance christian practices of sharing in wine and the bread on on sabbath on sunday in the church when the church congreg congregation shares in wine and bread they are actually symbolically partaking of jesus's body and his blood the symbolism of such a moment means that by sharing in jesus's blood and body you become one with jesus himself you become one with god yourself such moments of transubstantiality can also be seen in the conceptualization of the sharing of substance again cast and defines different kinds of substances but is loath to just limit it to a particular list substances may be of many kinds i just identified blood breast milk food clothing saliva and sexual fluids in different cultures different sets of these substances come into action together to make kin and kinship but most importantly the kind of kinning that occurs through the sharing of these substances is known as co-substantiality later we'll discuss how marshall salins in his very influential article on what kinship is discusses the importance of co-substantiality but the inherent idea of co-substantiality is the transference of attributes and selfhood to other people in different cultures the sharing of these substances has different levels of importance they are not all seen to be at the same level amongst the malay for instance breast milk has great importance and if two children have partaken of the breast milk of the same woman and they may be belonging to different mothers they are still linked together this is particularly important when seen in relation to other cultures where breast milk may not have that kind of relationality however in case of food too the warmth of the food and the coldness of the food mark out kinship even more if you recall in the brief discussion on sara lam study of widows in west bengal we looked at how widows and younger widows especially are only fed cold foods because warm food carries with it sexual heat in this way this ingestion of warm food even in indian context even in the indian context carries with it the message and the symbolism of seeking to create more kin heat creates desire and desire creates children thus the transference and sharing of sexual fluids between a husband and wife are important elements to give birth to a child to conceive the child in its essence this conception brings together the husband and wife and also marks their relationality if you remember our brief discussion on veena das's masks and faces you will recall how the sexual relationship that the man shares with his wife is constantly conflicted with the love and affection that he shares with his mother both involve the transference of substance with the mother the man shares breast milk and deeper love of of a maternal kind with his wife he shares sexual fluids and a deeper love that leads to the birth of progeny this is critical in understanding how relationships come through through relatedness while we look at the notion of relatedness uh, one of the ways in which carsten builds on this is by looking at how substance and blood a uh, substance and relationality are far away from the idea of code which schneider spoke of code is a more a uh, rule based identification of certain substances she suggests moving away from the schneiderian framework of code and substance to look at more lived realities of kinning where people transfer certain elements and identify each other as kin now this is particularly important in terms of how it 
reworks the idea, ideology of symbolism that Schneider had spoken about. We have to look at the idea of substance as a, in a particular context and in relation to how we think of kin and kinship. Therefore, it becomes important to see uh, once again how the process of making kin is invoked here. You cannot just become kin by ingesting milk, it happens over a period of time. In Mary Wiesmantel's very influential paper on adoption in Africa, she speaks of how African childless couples make kin by regularly feeding children they may not be related to. An orphan child who wanders into somebody's home is fed warm food. The act of feeding warm food is to share substances. You might be thinking how this makes sense. By feeding a child through your hands, you pass the elements of your own skin into the child's saliva. This is deep. Let me give you an example from the Indian context to make more sense. In Indian households, for a long time, mothers and wives uh, eat food off their husband's plates. They may not be washed. It is very normal for many of our mothers to eat off our own plates after we have finished as children not as adults usually. It's a moment of making kin. A dirty plate where you or your father has eaten is not a detriment for your mother because she's already linked to you. Over years by eating off this dirty plate, though it has its hierarchical and power linkages which we have discussed and will discuss as we go into the lecture forward, this meaningful exchange of saliva and substance makes you even more closer to your mother your mother comes closer to you. The idea that close kin are not separate but must share deeply in each other's bodily uh, fluids, whether it's saliva, blood or sexual fluid, again and again resurrects the idea of who are close kin. Not all kin eat of each other's plates. If you think of communal practices in countries like Egypt and Morocco, where men of a household and extended kin eat of the same plate, you will realize that this act of eating of the same plate is also the act of sharing kin. The moment you do so, you make deep kinship relations. It's not a fleeting engagement. It is a deeper, more meaningful exchange of relatedness. Thus, the moment of understanding uh, the transference of relatedness is critically based on number one, the exchange of bodily fluids, and number two, the idea of a long-term sharing. Bodily fluids again here are not just restricted to bodily fluids, but the idea surrounding bodily fluids. Slightly complicated, but it has meaning at different levels. So for instance, if you live in the same house and partake of the same relationships in the house, you are kin. Or you may not be kin, but in particular cultural ideologies, that makes you kin. Similarly, over a long period of time, making kin becomes essential. This act of making kin happens over and through life cycle rituals, through everyday acts of feeding, eating and intercourse. It is not a momentary exchange of a, a thread tied around a wrist or a ritual but a long-term investment in making kin. The idea of time and temporality here is critical to understanding how substance works. It cannot work in one attempt, but must be replicated across time and across generations sometimes to actually create a sense of kinship. It is also how people value these transferences over a period of time. If you think of uh, substance and relationality in more detail, you need to reflect on your own life and you will find such interesting examples. As we grow older and have more friends, we often create such kinship by drinking of the same cup of tea. It is part of making kin and friendship relations where you actually share that moment of togetherness. Karsten's study of relatedness has come to inform much of anthropological research and study. It is important to understand that her idea of relatedness as linked to indigenous and folk idioms of kinship has become very, very critical to understanding how different cultures think of kinship. It has also become very potent 
in creating a cross-cultural uh, comparison which is very, very, uh, very, very systematic. In this sense, in her volume on relatedness, the anthropologist Helen Lambert looks at Rajasthani kinship. In her analysis of Rajasthani kinship, she actually looks at how sentiment and emotions are become an important part of creating relatedness. How can we think of sentiment and emotions as substance? They are very important substances that are related. They may not be strictly bodily substances, but they have very important ideas of connectivity and relatedness. Thus, in Rajasthan, where the rule of patrilineal descent means that girls should be married out of the home, exogamy, uh, village exogamy entails that a girl must be married far away from her own natal village. This involves a lot of alienation and sadness on the part of the young girl who is being married out. Her links to her natal kin and village remain very strong. So whenever someone visits her from a village who may just be a neighbor or a distant extended kin, the moment of kinship is resurrected. Here there is no blood or food or sexual fluid, but the tie of the neighborhood, a locational tie that is resurrected. This relatedness is not something that is limited only to substances that are fluid, liquid, but also substances they, that may be solid and uh, st not fluid or standing in time. That is critical to looking at how relatedness constructs itself. For Lambert, most of these Rajasthani women look back and connect with their natal kin through people who visit from the village. The village tie is as important as the blood tie or that shared through breast milk. Here sentiment becomes a very important and potent mode of remembering your natal family and creating new linkages. In terms of looking at what Karsten discusses in further detail, in case of India, relatedness has come to inform contemporary studies to a large extent. One of the most influential studies rec uh, in recent times has been Cecilia Busby's study of the fishing community in Kerala. The Maria, Maria I'm sorry, the Maria Ward uh, of Kerala are a fishing community which practices particular forms of kinship. They are a community which follows Yugzori local residence, which basically means that on marriage the man moves to live with his wife's family, but uh, give dowry to the groom's side on marriage. This is a particular form of kinship which is, uh, which is prevalent amongst this community and forms a large part of what Busby looks at in terms of substance sharing and the making of kinship and gender. In Busby's research, gender is deeply enmeshed in the idea of kinship and she finds that substance adds to notions of both the making of men and women and the creation of kinship. But she looks at it through different modes of analysis. One is through the fishing community in Kerala and two is through an engagement with the community of hijras in India or eunuchs. Now this is critical in looking at how substance comes to be marked on our bodies itself and how the transference of particular substances from one body to other, another is not as simple as just donating blood or organ donation but carries with it multiple meanings. Thus, it's important to know that in Busby's study, while the men move to women's, uh, to their wife's home, they are also paid dowry. But that doesn't stop there. The connections that happen between the two are through the shared substance. Busby notes that amongst the fishing community of, in Kerala that she studies, men and women are distinctly different. They are not superior or inferior as we have been studying till now, in, especially in case of North India but different. Thus, the difference is marked especially in terms of how men carry particular male factor or male blood in their semen which they pass on to their children and women carry the female factor or female blood in their womb and through their best breast milk which they pass to their children. This gendered substance marks the children in particular way. So, it is well known that sons are like their fathers and daughters are like their mothers. It is particularly bi-gendered. In this sense, uh, the notion of men and women works also at a larger level of the community where women 
trade in fish and take care of economy and money etc while the men actually go out to fish. The division of labor is sharp and does not fall into each other's domains. Women take care of the home and of the market and are economically more independent than the men. They have economic power and they decide who calls the shots in terms of household expenditure. The men follow the women in terms of creating and making those products or getting those products from the sea that the women will sell. However, this does not, this distinction does not mean that they are separate. For Busby, this distinction plays out through what I would like to think of as the closest parallel in the Chinese uh, Confucian ideology of the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang of, a, of the particular design of the white and the black coming together seamlessly together even though they are different means that two, whole, two parts make a whole. Yet the two parts here men and women in the fishing community in Kerala are not in themselves. It is when they come together that really the whole society comes together. Busby takes the example of eating together that the husband and wife indulge in that creates linkages between them. They share food from the same plate that makes them more connected to each other and that adds to the identity of their child. This she links to in an interesting uh, mode of analysis to the hijras in India. She suggests that the hijras in India are neither men nor women and they are co traditionally considered as such. But they carry within themselves certain ideas of substance that can be used to compare and think about the Keralite fishermen and women. This is interesting because the hijras are neither men nor women primarily because they cannot procreate. Whereas in case of the Kerala community that she is studying, the act of procreation makes men and women. The act of being able to pass your semen makes your man and the act of being able to carry a child and breastfeed the child makes your woman. So what happens in case of the hijra? In case of the hijra, the absence of substance does not mean that they are not persons or particular individuals in their own right. The absence of substance gives them a different sense of self. They create a different community where they seek potency through worship of a particular goddess. This sense of ungenderedness and genderedness in case of the Kerala fishing community means that substances occupy different meanings in different senses and different communities. This truly brings alive Karsten's analysis of what is in essence a very fluid concept and falls back into the relevance of uh, folk and indigenous categories of meaning making. This is also important in how Busby links this to the idea of how uh, the whole notion of separate gender and separate forms of being and making are essential to actually make a person whole. Thus the sharing of fluids and the sharing of the partible self becomes a symbol of the whole body. For Busby, it is clearly uh, an idea which is linked to a, a whole body being both permeable and whole. When we talk of permeability, we talk of how body boundaries are fluid and open to receiving and rejecting. That does not mean that that body is not in its own self a whole body, but that it is willing to engage with the act of making and unmaking. This fluidity does not take away from the body's sense of self but opens it up to other influences. This philosophical idea is most important when we look at how we make kin. Rigidity in our body boundaries means we are unwilling and unable to entertain other forms of kinship and kin making. A form of rigidity and boundary making that is almost always evident in Euro-American kinship is somehow absent in other parts of the world. However, even within Euro-American kinship, as Leslie Sharp notes, fixed individual bounded bodies become permeable when the time is ripe. This is especially seen in her study of biosentimentality, when organ recipients of organs from dead uh, organ donors become almost a part of those donors. Leslie Sharp finds that relatives of the dead donor seek parts of their own kin in the recipient. <laughs>
If you recall, recently a news item reported that at the wedding of a young woman, she invited the father of the person whose heart she is carrying to officiate at the wedding. It was a sentimental moment and images of the young bride holding the man close to her suggested that there is a kinship that emerges between strangers through the act of transference. Again, I come back to the very in interesting example that I mentioned in another class about blood donation. We might think of donating blood among strangers, but it makes an important case for how substance relationality works. As I mentioned uh, in the hit uh, film, Hindi Hindi, hit Hindi film, Amar Akbar Anthony, three unknown men and unrelated men come together to actually save their mother in the end through the act of blood donation. They are essentially related, but nonetheless that makes them kin. Such a trope and plot is evident in many films and stories, where strangers become kin through the act of transference and sharing of body substance. Biosentimentality, as Sharp mentions, is something that emerges from this act of sharing. She also links back to what Castan is suggesting in all her analysis, that ultimately we are also linked through these essential ideas of body substance and blood and milk. Coming back to Cecilia Busby, the idea of, uh, of sharing therefore also brings with it an important notion of complementarity. Complementarity means that you just can't share with everybody, but the act of sharing itself complements two or more people in a mode that connects them together. This is critical to understanding how we would like to think of kinship ultimately, as a mode which is dynamic, as a moment that is dynamic, as something that is constantly making and unmaking itself. In that sense, we have to also think of kin that are not standing alone in space and time. You do not have permanence in kinship. We all tend to think of permanence in kinship, but kinship is not always permanent. It is constantly rejected and affirmed. Life cycle rituals are one example of how kinship is rejected and somebody else is affirmed in the place of kin. Kinship is also rejected and affirmed at home when someone rejects a kin or, or removes the kin from family. Kinship is not without its fissures, as I discussed in an earlier lecture. In remembering the conflicts and the fissures that kinship has, we also have to look at how kinship comes together through the act of sharing itself. In the analysis of these ideas, of sharing and not sharing and fluidity and boundedness is a sense of morality that we cannot forget. Maurice Bloch, the very well-known Marxist anthropologist, talks of kinship in terms of a moral canvas. He refers to how kinship operates at two levels, one at the level of reciprocity and, le and second at the level of its own morality. We have already spoken of reciprocity and gift giving for the past two lectures. But here Maurice Bloch is bringing in a very important category of reciprocity. He discusses how kinship uh, when reciprocal over a long period of time and over a short period of time carries with it different levels of obligation. Kinship, uh, kinship in a short period of time carries with it a sense of reciprocity that might end very soon. There is no boundedness, there is no obligatory relationship there and there are no, most importantly, there are no guarantees. Such relationships are marked by fleeting engagements. Block identifies friendship, neighborhood ties and other such relationships as part of short term reciprocity among skin. However, long term reciprocity, which according to Maurice Block is more in the domain of kin related by blood and marriage means that you constantly call upon these people to reflect back and feed into your relationship. Long term reciprocity is very important to understand how you link each other over generations. Thus long term reciprocity thinks through the long term giving and taking. We have already discussed give and take in the last lecture and this becomes even more potent when seen in terms of substance relationality. As I mentioned earlier, kinship works through a processual idiom of giving and taking. The longer the giving and taking, the stronger the kinship tie. 
whether through gifts, whether through substance or whether through reciprocity. The idea of, sorry, the idea of uh, kinship in terms of its morality is played out by Bloch in looking at how kinship terminology carries this particular sense of morality. Each kinship terminology comes with its own uh, rights, duties and obligations. You do not call an uncle just for the heck of it. It carries with it certain baggage and certain ideas of being an uncle. However, the subsuming or extension of such a kinship uh, terminology to people who do not belong such a category carries with it a certain sense of utilitarian morality. You extend certain terms to certain others based on a notion of use and short term or long term reciprocity. Thus, morality is also deeply interlinked with reciprocity. Maurice Bloch's analysis is linked in very interesting ways to the idea of relatedness again. Here again, we are not fixating on particular categories of relating, but identifying how people think of each other and their relationships through various parameters of understanding the same. Contemporary relationships as imagined especially in popular cinema both in Hollywood and in India will carry these ideas of relationships that are beyond just biology and marriage. You just have to look around to see how contemporary relationships give a lot of importance to close ties with friends. Uh, in, in the analysis of marriage wedding, contemporary wedding photography, uh, Parul Bharadwaj finds Facebook as a very important space for creating linkages with friends. If you had to just look at pictures of weddings on Facebook, you would find a diminishing representation of close kin, including parents and brothers and sisters and a large number of photo photographs exhibiting and representing the bride and groom's closer friends in different poses and moments of happiness. This is a privileging of certain ties over certain others. Wedding rituals are more about the couple now, at least in urban India and their close network of kin. These kin may not necessarily include the chacha or the chachi or the uncle, aunt and extended biological or a final family, but do certainly include friends and friends and friends of friends. This creates a different meaning of linkage. This idea of representing a different form of kinship morality comes through even more in thinking about how relatedness is fluid and plural in many ways. In Gerd de Neve's very interesting study of dye factory workers in, workers in Tamil Nadu, we find relatedness being played out in ways in which conflict and uh, collaboration work. Here kin may not really be kin and non-kin may actually turn out to be kin. Gear Deneve looks at uh, the Vanayar caste, which is a scheduled caste community in Tamil Nadu, to look at how they negotiate their place in the dyeing industry. The Vanayar actually started as workers in the cloth dyeing industry in Tamil Nadu and were hired by dominant caste groups such as the Chettiyas to work in their factories. The dyeing business is supposed to be dirty and involves a lot of labor which is why traditionally as a caste based occupation the vanyars fitted right in. Over a, over a period of time many of the vanyars went up the ladder and became owners of factories themselves. They went on to hire other vanyars to participate in the making of cloth dyeing. This act itself becomes a mode of relatedness and kinship making as Gear Deneve speaks. So when looking at the Vanyar caste, Gear Deneve looks at how uh, the employment of kin becomes a particular way of doing business in the tie-dye industry in Tamil Nadu. He looks at Shivaji's factory and actually mentions how different people he hires are actually members of his extended kin group. Let us see how. In Shivaji's factory, Shivaji's wife da, uh, dies and bundles the cloth. Shivaji's father also bundles the yarn. 
Shivaji's mother's brother or mama also dies young. Similarly, Shivaji's father's brother's sons, cousins known as Tampi help him in dying yarn. One of his Tampi's wives also works in the factory. Shivaji, a Vanyar, employs other Vanyars in his factory. All of these, especially the Tampis, live in the same neighborhood. So, the tie of relatedness becomes that much more complicated. If we had to look at the number of relatives involved here, out of his 10 employees, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 6 employees make up close and extended kin in his factory. The other four are related through the ties of neighborhood. This makes relatedness work in very different ways. Shivaji is able to call upon his father, his father's brother and then through his father's brother, his Tumpi and the Tumpi's wife to come and work for him at any time based on the idea of obligation and reciprocity. This is important for Shivaji because even though he may not be able to pay them the correct wage on time, the links of kinship and the relatedness that he builds through that means that his kin owe him an obligation. Gerd and Eve takes a very interesting example of a particular week during which Shivaji's uh, employees have been working very hard at the mill. They want a break on Saturday but are unable to take a break on Saturday because Shivaji resurrects the idea of their kinship relations to call on them again. Such an idea builds on the, the notion of relatedness not only through substance but the morality of kinship. Interestingly, in Tamil Nadu where the tie and dye factory works, uh, where the tie and dye factory exists, Girdeneve finds that the increasing mechanization of dyeing fabrics has led to a different kind of uh, employ employee base. Now factory owners have to also employ non-kin. At every point, factory owners constantly use the word sandukarar to uh, resurrect the idea of relatives and relations. Sandukarar in Tamil means, Sondam means related. In that sense, the idea of being related becomes very important when making relationships not only with kin but also with non-kin. Girdani finds many of the factory owners making kinship with the non-kin to make them into, to turn their relationships non-kinship into one that are obligatory. He calls upon their loyalty towards him and the factory through the words of Sondam. On the other hand, Girdaniv also interestingly finds that most of the times relatives fall back on the idea of helping, of supporting kin because they are unable to fulfill the requirements of, uh, of that the employer seeks from them. Kin may not necessarily always fulfill what is required of them. They may try to get away with the kinship obligation. Thus, in Gear de Neve study, many of the factory owners were falling, were not able to trust their kin relations anymore. Kin were not able to fulfill the obligatory demands of the employer, instead reneging on it, in which case non-kin also did not perform. Thus, the demands of relatedness, however they may be resurrected, do not always fall through. Relatedness itself is a fluid category which may or may not work. It does not mean that substance and terms of endearment or relatedness always turn into kinship and kin making. The rejection of those terms is also a mode of kinship and kin making. This is the dynamism of the concept of relatedness. Relatedness has been used across cultures and across contexts to look at how people think of their close relationships. They may also think of their distant and non-existent relationships through this notion of relatedness. Its potency and its power is particularly important in thinking about how people resurrect 
ideas of being and relating. In that sense, relatedness is crucial to our study of anthropology of kinship. The ambiguities within such a notion are particularly important as we go further into the study of new kinship and alternative kinship. Towards the end of this course, we will realize that kinship itself has come full circle as we make kin with other species and not just human beings. We have to think of kinship now as a more dynamic mode of being and becoming where our own sense of self and personhood is implicit in the idea and ways of relating. Karsten in her, in her conceptualization of relatedness itself goes through many ideas of many different ideas of being and relating. One of our most potent categories is that of memory. Discussed in an earlier lecture, memory according to Karsten is a very powerful tool of kinship. Houses especially in caste and study carry long term memory for different relatives. Janki Abraham has used this idea in a study of wedding photography in Kerala. Wedding photography especially old photography kept in albums that are stored in hidden corners of the home carry with it sense of relatedness and remembrance which only comes through different modes of relatedness. Here remembrance and memory resurrects relationships with people who may be diseased and not in existence anymore. But is that no less, is that not kinship or is that kinship? It is one of the ways in which caste and encourages us to think of kinship as not just kinship but much more than that, having a sense of fluidity that carries with it many different meanings and ideas. We are at a point in our study of kinship where we can develop different modes of engagement, whether through the idea of organ donation or through the idea of blood donation or through the idea of ingestion of food or most dynamically through the idea of carrying someone else's child. As we go into the study of reproductive technologies and new forms of technological engagement, we will see that technology itself becomes kin to us. Thus in Donna Haraway's very interesting work on technology and robos, she suggests that cyborgs are the new form of kinning that we have to undertake. Part human, part robotic, cyborgs also are our kin. If anything, or if, if we have to look at indications at popular culture, any form of newer engagement in popular culture suggests that we are increasingly in an era where robos will become our friends. More than friends, they might just become our kin. And this form of engagement asks us again and again, how do we identify kin if not through fluid engagements of relatedness? Relatedness itself therefore is not limited to certain ideas and boundaries but encourages you, instead actually provokes you to make new ways of relating with other people. Under relatedness, any other criteria or parameter can work. The tools of relating are not limited to as I said bodily liquid substance but may be relational, stuck in time, place, spatial. It may be linked to you through the sharing of books or the sharing of poetry. Relatedness is in many ways all around us and helps us to undertake a more dynamic vision of our world and of our kin. On that note and in anticipation of the next lecture, thank you and see you soon.